Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So, okay, so what I'm going to do today is to go to the second part of my lectures and talk about uh, coarsening. So, okay, let me go ahead. So I have listed here a set of very general references. Um, there are books, there are review articles. You can have a look at the slides later on if you want to get access to, to these references here. And uh, well, I have a kind of a longish plan for the uh, talk today. We will see how far I can get. So first of all, I want to introduce the phenomenon and then you know, give different ways of uh, modeling this phenomenon. I have to insist here upon the fact that what I'm going to say uh, today is very general and it's something that I think that any statistical physicist have to, has to know um, because there are applications in many, many different um, you know, situations. And um, so it's, uh, it's quite basic as, as a set of uh, notions. Uh, so, okay, I will tell you about um, quenches uh, when you cool down a system from a disordered initial condition and you put it either at the critical point of your um, phase diagram or in the other phase uh, of the phase diagram and then you try to see how the system evolves. And uh, there are many kinds of observables, correlation functions, linear response functions that tell us about um, you know, the global and also local in some cases uh, behavior of these systems. So, um, okay, so this is the list of topics. Uh, we'll see how far we can get. And uh, let me start with them. So the phenomenon, as I said, it's the um, generic question of what happens to a macroscopic system when you take it across a phase transition or to the critical point or to the critical parameters, if there are lines. And uh, you have to understand in which way um, order in the low temperature phase, let's say in the ordered phase, or criticality and you know, all the fluctuations of typical uh, critical points develop in the course of time. So uh, it's a relatively easy problem in the sense that we start from a problem with, in, for which we know the phase diagram, we know the criticality, we know the critical points, the critical lines, everything. Uh, we know the equilibrium phases uh, on both sides, all sides of the possible transitions. So the asymptotic state to which the system wants to go, we know it. So we know the equilibrium phases, we know the target, but we don't necessarily know how the system evolves towards that target. Uh, there are cases in which um, the uh, dynamical microscopic rules are not those that arise from Newton dynamics and physical uh, rules, but they can be more generic actually. And in those cases, uh, instead of having equilibrium states as targets, we have what are called absorbing states. I'm not going to talk about this, but just to let you know that the problematic is roughly the same. Um, they are the same issues which are addressed in... I cannot hear it. Uh, now it's okay. Ah. You got muted for some time. I don't know why this is doing. Okay. Uh, and now, now you can see yeah. my screen. Uh, right? We can't see your screen now. No. Why? Okay, go back to Zoom. Oh, because I got disconnected. I think I will have to do it from my laptop because I don't know. It, I, I probably lost the, um, the Wi Fi. Okay. Yeah. I have lost the Wi-Fi from the tablet. Okay, yeah, let me do it. I will not be able to write, but it doesn't matter. Okay. And I'm closing the other one. I have to go to the share here. Uh, yeah, so I was uh, yeah, saying that we also know the microscopic um, rules and from them the dynamic mechanisms that take the systems, uh, try to take the system towards equilibrium or the absorbing states. Uh, so we know a lot of things about these problems, but then it's a technical issue uh, that arises and that we, uh, when we try to get, you know, analytical expressions for the evolution, it, it gets uh, complicated. So you will see what I, what I mean by that. Okay, so why are we interested in this problem? Because okay, as I said, the range of applicability is very, very large. Uh, just 
some two examples here. Um, there are people who actually, and some of them are here in this conference where I am now, uh, who work for um, well research institutes, but associated to companies who want to uh, get some special properties of certain materials, and then you know the way in which these materials develop in after preparation has an impact in, uh, for example, the optomechanical properties of uh, phase separating glasses. Just to give you an example. And there's also applications that come from even, you know, gravitational theories, cosmology, what happens with topological defects, uh, as um, that I will introduce later on, uh, you know, after the universe has pulled down and uh, evolved from you know, the very beginning of times. So there, the range of applicability is huge, but there is also the fundamental interest, you know, it's a theoretical problem, which is hard to solve because it goes beyond perturbation theory, it's not a perturbative problem that we have at hand. So, it's difficult from a theoretical point of view. And uh, then you can also ask some other fundamental questions like, uh, you know, what happens in glasses in, that we don't understand so well, we don't know whether, which are the equilibrium phases and, uh, you know, where is the system trying to go? And then you can ask whether also coarsening phenomena, domain growth phenomena of the kind I will discuss, uh, are hidden somewhere in their evolution without uh, the to identify them. Okay, there's also issues about generics of macroscopic systems out of equilibrium that you can ask in this context and that you can maybe later apply uh, to, to other cases. Okay, so the context is the context of open systems. Uh, I will focus on those. So I will have my systems coupled to an environment as I discussed uh, yesterday. Uh, so I can go through this transparency quickly. I just want to stress that similar questions can be asked in the quantum context, but uh, okay, we'll not touch upon those. So the simplest possible example where you can see these um, questions appear is the case of a two-dimensional easing model. So there you can draw nice pictures and uh, see the configurations, uh, how they evolve in the course of time. So what I'm showing here is that I'm picking an initial configuration of my 2D easing problem uh, at infinite temperature. So at infinite temperature, the probability of having a spin up or spin down is a half. So each of them will choose up or down with probability a half. And I will typically see a configuration like the ones which are here on the left, uh, which are you know, as many up and down, but very disordered. Mm? Very locally, you can have as many ups and downs uh, as uh, you know, sides you have. So um, these are the initial states, which correspond to infinite temperature configuration. And then you perform the quench, meaning that instantaneously you set temperature to be, for example, at the critical point here in the upper row or below the critical point uh, in the lower row. So for the 2D easing model, you know the critical temperature. So Onsager computed it, so you have an expression, and then you, know, you choose the um, temperature at which the system will evolve to be either critical or below critical. And what you will see in the course of time, and I will define the microscopic dynamics uh, in a second, but bear with me, you, there is a microscopic dynamics that uh, corresponds to the coupling of the system to the bath at that temperature. Uh, what the system does is to, you see, develop regions where there are, there is local order of red or white. So here it's fuzzier. Mm? You see that there are more fluctuations of red within white and white within red than here. This is because I am at the critical temperature above. Below, there are less fluctuations uh, within the domains of the opposite color. Uh, but OK, how many there are will depend on the temperature at which you are doing the evolution. So I guess that in this trans set of uh, slides, uh, set of uh, snapshots, sorry. Uh, below, I have evolved the system at a very low temperature, and then I don't see many fluctuations within the, the white or red color and vice versa. So still, what you have to... Um... Uh, hi. Uh, yes, hi. Yes. Uh, so when you say you can quench the temperature, what do you mean? Do you change the temperature of the bath or the system? Yes. or do you... Of the bath, exactly. So the system is coupled to the bath. So you have yeah. to think that you have an oven, let's say, at very yeah. high temperature, and then you, you know, very rapidly change the temperature of the bath to, to a different value. Hmm? 
I see. So it, it, it can be that you initialize the system uh, in maximally mixed states, say, and there is no interaction with the uh, bath. And then you just establish the coupling with the uh, bath at a, at a finite temperature. It could be, but in this case, actually, my bath was at infinite temperature in the initial condition. Okay. Okay. You could also do what you say, but here okay. I was just, you know, complete disorder. So uh, I was uh, initializing like at infinite temperature. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So you see the development of order of different kinds uh, at the criticality or below criticality, but I mean, it's visual. I mean, you can see it from, from the images that something is going on uh, as time goes on. Uh, you can also see that there are in this lower slide here, a snapshot here in particular, you can see that there are interfaces, right? So these interfaces are what I'm calling generically uh, topological defects. These are an example of topological defects. So uh, this is the thing that the system would like to erase in the course of time. You see that there are more here than there, and there are definitely many more here than here and then here. So the number of these interfaces is decreasing in the course of time because it's there that the energy is concentrated and the system is releasing energy to the bath and trying to eliminate those uh, interfaces to eventually reach one of the two target states, which at low temperatures are, you know, everybody up, everybody down with some fluctuations within. Um, but uh, this is what it would like to do, but it hasn't done it yet. I mean, in this snapshot, you see that there are still uh, both colors present as much one as the other one. And uh, in this one, you can, what the system would like to do is to go to the critical, typical critical configuration of the critical point, and it's still evolving towards it, but it hasn't reached it yet. Uh, I have a question uh, from the previous slide. So it means if the, if the quench is uh, very fast, I mean, almost instantaneous, as, mm -hmm. as is mentioned on the slide, then what is the difference between doing things this way and, and the doing I mean, starting at t equals zero with the same initial state and t less than tc. Starting at, at time zero with the same initial state and? Yeah, I mean, so what is the difference between the two cases? See, in one case, the quench is instantaneous. So the system won't be able to react, right? If no, no, it does react. So in both cases, the quench is instantaneous. But in the difference between the two lines is that in one case, uh, after the instantaneous quench, I do it uh, to the critical point. And in the other case, I do it uh, to a temperature below the critical point. Uh, no, I was saying if, if the quench is instantaneous, I mean, very mm -hmm. fast, yes. uh, then uh, means it's faster than the system can react. Yeah, well, yes. So then what is the difference between just starting with an initial state and if with T less than TC or T equal to TC? Uh, because if, if I were starting from an initial state which was in equilibrium at T smaller than TC, I could be starting from a state which is completely ordered because equilibrium after a spontaneous symmetry breaking, no? So okay. uh, in equilibrium below TC, I have two states possible, one up and one down. Okay. Right? So I would be starting from a completely ordered state and then basically apart from thermal fluctuations within this uh, completely ordered configuration, I wouldn't see much. So uh, I have to start to see this phenomenon. I have to start from a configuration which is not one of equilibrium uh -huh. under the evolving conditions. Uh, okay, okay. You see what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I understood. Thank you. Yeah, it would have been useful to be able to write but Okay, and I have a blackboard oh. here. If I find, um, yeah, I think there is some way to write. If I find a way to write, next I can, you know, turn the computer and eventually write on the blackboard. Okay, so there are many examples. So can, I, can I ask a question about yes. the previous slide? So instead of quenching, if you if you vary the temperature gradually, mm -hmm. uh, what happens? And then say reach the critical temperature or temperature below TC, then mm -hmm. you don't get uh, this kind of uh, phase separation kind of thing. It, well, the problem is that the relaxation time at the critical point is diverging as well. So uh, you should do this quench, you know, in a in an infinite system, the relaxation time is infinity. So you wouldn't be able to go as slowly as necessary to follow the equilibrium 
uh, imposed by your evolving conditions. Uh, but you, what you can do is in a finite system, okay, then you can tune your cooling rate to be sufficiently slow so as to at each time step follow equilibrium and do another adiabatic sorry, evolution uh, in the course of uh, time. Uh, but okay, there, there's, um, again, there has been quite a bit of uh, activity around these slow cooling uh, processes recently coming from, again, gravity at the beginning and uh, quantum situations uh, more recently. Uh, so, so there are also interesting questions that you can ask concerning, you know, the, the, the competition between the cooling rate and um, the internal time evolution of the system and how this uh, influences what you are seeing. But um, you know, for an infinite system, you will still see this because relaxation time diverges at the critical point and also below the critical point. Sorry, but uh, like we, I mean, usually in elementary courses of statmic, we, we plot this magnetization versus a temperature thing. No? So, like, mm -hmm. so yeah, I mean, uh, like there we vary temperature uh, uh, continuously, no? Mm -hmm. So like that relaxation issue is not there. You know, it's not there, no, because you are in standard statistical statistics uh, lectures. You don't talk about dynamics. You just, uh, you know, assume that you are in equilibrium, and then you do this uh, m against t uh, plot, which I think I have it. Let's see. Okay, I have some examples here. I can I go faster? Uh... Well, okay, I don't see where I have it somewhere, but uh, I, you, let me check if the um, if the pen which is here works or not. Okay, so what you are referring to is this m against t. Uh, so this is tc, m is zero here, and then you have the two branches. Can you see it? Uh, yes, yes, I can see. Um, so this is one, this is minus one, and this is uh, magnetization density. Um, with the averages computed in equilibrium. Okay, so, um, okay, so this is an equilibrium. Um, property, uh, which is telling you that below TC, your equilibrium consists in two possible kinds of configurations. One where in the lower branch, most of the spins are pointing down, one in the upper branch where most of the spins are pointing up. Uh, but there are some you know, fluctuations somewhere in different places that make the magnetization at finite temperature be slower, uh, sorry, lower than the um, maximum possible value that you can have, minimum in this case, minus one. And the same here, so you have some fluctuations. So these are typical equilibrium configurations uh, here and there. And because of the symmetry of the problem, you have two. Uh, now, what I'm doing, and I don't have another color, what I'm doing now is to say, okay, I take a typical initial configuration of infinite temperature, and all of a sudden, very quickly, I set my temperature of evolution to be below TC. And I want to know how the zero magnetization, which I had initially, which is the one that I inherited from the uh, initial configuration, will go you know, either here or there in the course of time, as time evolves. And the way in which uh, it does it is by you know, building these domains. Uh, and uh, growing them uh, gradually. And the growth takes so long that, uh, you know, in the end, it will take a time, as I will argue, that goes like the system size uh, to a power. And uh, which is this power depends on the kind of microscopic uh, dynamics that you have uh, in this particular case. And it also depends on whether you are quenching to the critical point or below. And this is what I want to discuss now. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. I have a question. Yes. Uh, 
so uh, so i was wondering what happens if you for example quench system above critical temperature uh, okay so above the critical temperature if you quench it here very high temperature not much i mean it you know the typical equilibrium will be reached very quickly and uh, you will see configurations like the ones which are on the left but if you quench it close to the uh, critical temperature but not very far away from it uh, then, okay, you will have some information. The system will know that it's close to criticality. So it will grow, uh, you know, configurations like the, can, the kind that you have here, but you will not have fluctuations of all sizes because here the equilibrium correlation length does not diverge. It's very large. It's much larger than, you know, whatever microscopic uh, distance you have in your system, but it's not infinity. Hmm? So it's, uh, this is more than infinity. So it will grow configurations of this kind with the fluctuations reaching some finite length hmm, that will be uh, more, of, more or less of this order. Uh, and then, you know, it will stop. Then it will remain uh, this order. So you will not have all sizes fluctuations like at exactly the critical point, but yes, the closer you get, the larger these fluctuations will be. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah, my question is when we quench to critical temperature, Bell system follow dynamical scaling? Yes, yes, yes. It will come later. <laughs> okay. Yes. yes. Uh, one thing, how, how much does this, uh, this particular uh, structure that uh, form that it takes at TC or less than TC depend upon the interactions that we started with? And uh, how much does it like? It looks like it's like localization, right? Like many body localization. Uh, oh no, many body localization, not here. No, no, no. Uh, it, 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 it will depend on the. Um, there is universality behind all this. So uh, the microscopic details will not be very important apart from uh, if there are conservation laws in your dynamics. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, well, the dimension of the other parameter, which in this case is, uh, is a scalar or the parameter is the magnetization density. So um, there is uh, just you know, a scalar thing, but if you had a vectorial or the parameter with Heisenberg spins, for example, or XY spins, then things might change. And, um, and yeah, whether there are symmetries, I mean, the kind of symmetries that your interactions have. Uh, so, and the microscopic rules for the dynamics, I don't know if I said it already. So uh, the, these are the three things that will, properties which are, are, are able to classify, you know, the universality classes, and I will come back to that later. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay so I had that many examples here, I will go quickly through them because otherwise we don't have time. So the Modeling of these dynamics uh, for the uh, easing model can be done in two ways. So one way is more microscopic than the other one. The very microscopic one, what you do is, okay, you have your easing model and then you give rules to update the spins. And since you couple to a bath, the way to do it is to propose Monte Carlo, uh, for example, or Glauber um, rules that tell you, you know, what is the probability to flip a spin. And uh, the probabilities to flip a spin, uh, well, they typically uh, tend to decrease the energy of the system. So, you know, flips that go in the good direction of aligning with the neighbors are uh, accepted with a high probability. But there are also inverse flips that are accepted with some probability, which depends on temperature, and that will be able to, to capture these uh, fluctuations uh, that you also have uh, you know, in equilibrium when you are at low temperatures because of the temperature if it's non-zero. So, okay, there are ways to um, propose which are these probabilities. I will not discuss those, but what is important to know is that you can, uh, for example, in the case of these easing spins, consider two kinds of evolutions depending on what you do with the local magnetization. So one is what is called non-conserved or the parameter dynamics in which fluctuations in which you go, for example, from this case where you have oppositely pointing spins to align spins in just one flip. So you do, do not conserve the local magnetization here, which was zero 
in this configuration and it's true, let's say, in this uh, other configuration. So these are moves that do not conserve the local oil parameter, which is the local magnetization. So this is uh, relevant, this kind of dynamics to be make a magnetic systems because you know that, you know, the magnetization is not conserved, will go from zero to some value different from zero um, when the symmetry breaking mechanism is, is, um, is uh, applied or applies itself. While there is other kind of dynamics that is more uh, relevant for systems which are phase separating ones, where you have the, you know, the water and oil I was talking about yesterday, there you don't kill oil to make it water. So if you assign you know, up and down spins uh, to be water and oil, then the only moves that you can do are moves in which you conserve the local or the parameter, which is the sum of these two spins, which is always zero. Uh, so you can exchange particles, which means doing like this, but you cannot kill one to make another one. So this is the kind of microscopic rules which are called conserved order parameter dynamics, locally conserved order parameter dynamics. So these will be uh, uh, belonging to two different dynamic universality classes as characterized, for example, by the values that these exponent z take. Uh, they will be different. Uh, so this is the effect of the microscopic rule I was talking about beforehand. Um, you can go to, you know, extend these models to make the, 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 the variables vectorial, as I said. So then you go to kinetic n vector models, and you can also do uh, microscopic, uh, sorry, updates uh, of Monte Carlo kind for those, uh, mimicking the coupling to the bath. Okay, this is just to say that like this, you extend the set of models that you can work with, and these will also extend the set of universality classes uh, that you will build. Uh, excuse me, ma'am. Yes? In the like uh, oil water case, uh, mm -hmm. the flips are made between nearest neighbor objects only, or like, uh, like any I with any J? Yeah, the, the, the two kinds are possible. So when you do phase separation of water and oil, uh, well, you do it only locally because you don't jump, you know, one molecule to go somewhere else and, and exchange it to another one. But you can also consider from the theoretical point of view and also for some applications, it's relevant, the cases in which you exchange those uh, spins anywhere in the sample. So you can do it uh, anywhere and they will be different universality classes. Thanks. Thanks. You're welcome. Yeah. So, okay, this is the, the, the summary of uh, what is the quench. So you in initialize your system in some conditions, you change the uh, conditions uh, under which it evolves by changing the properties of the bath, say changing temperature, uh, take it to be at the critical or lower critical conditions and let the system evolve towards equilibrium and see how it does it. Another kind of way of modeling these problems is by um, going towards a Ginsburg Landau sort of a description in which you coarse grain your microscopic variables and you build a field. And then you propose a Langevin kind of dynamics for that field because now you go from discrete variables that were the spins, for example, the easing ones, to continuous fields, which are these scalar uh, or vectorial, depending on which are the variables you're working with, uh, fields, uh, which I'm calling phi here. Mm -hmm. So you can write a generic Langevin equation for that field, uh, including or dropping inertia, depending on you know, whether you are over damped or under damped, uh, a term with dissipation, deterministic force, which you take to be the variation of the Ginsburg-Landau sort of free energy, depending on the field, uh, with respect to the field and the noise, as we were doing yesterday, but just you know applying this Langevin equation to the the field, which is the coarse grained um, field uh, that you build from the microscopic variables, and there are equations of this kind appear in different areas, have been proposed in different phenomenological ways in different areas. And even in the quantum, you can see the, this is stochastic gross pitayevsky equation that, uh, you know, atomic physics people use um, is similar, not exactly the same, but it's similar to these kind of equations here. So, as I said, the coarse graining is uh, operated by uh, 
making a local average of the uh, discrete spins over a certain volume. And like this, you build the field. And following ginsburg landau ideas, uh, then you propose a form of this free energy of the field, uh, which uh, has a kind of lambda 5 fourth kind of potential with two minima. So uh, I don't know if I wrote it. Uh, can I erase here? Hmm. There's no eraser. I don't have well, okay, so. So you propose that based on um, symmetries and what you want to get, you propose that you have a double well kind of uh, form for this uh, free energy of phi. And uh, then you include also in, uh, as Higgins or Landau do, uh, a, a, an elastic term that penalizes the presence of interfaces. So you see that if you have an interface, phi changes from say positive to negative value. And then this uh, gradient here takes a non-zero value and then costs uh, something to the system to, to have an interface. So this term, what it's doing is saying that the system doesn't want to have interfaces. And what these terms are doing is that they are setting the uh, minima of this potential uh, to be at the two values of the value field phi that correspond to the two magnetizations that you uh, want to have at lower temperatures than the critical one. And uh, if you want to be at the critical point, okay, you set this uh, prefactor to be zero, and then you have flattish uh, form hmm, for the um, uh, for the f for the potential in the f of phi, and this is uh, the critical point. Okay. Okay, so I had it here. I forgot that I had it. So the form of this f, uh, the potential part of the f is uh, with a single minimum at phi equals zero, zero magnetization, high temperatures, uh, flattish at the critical point, and the two uh, wells um, below. And this is uh, the form of the or the parameters a function of temperature, uh, the same that I was drawn up there, but now written in terms of this uh, coarse grained field, uh, which is um, the um, the Ginsburg lambda one. Okay, so I have these two set of modelings, uh, microscopic or scalar field theories. I have these two kinds of dynamics, uh, the non-conserved other parameter and the conserved other parameter that are discussed at the level of the spins. This can also be uh, differentiated at the level of the uh, Langevin equations. And uh, well, I won't, don't want to go into the details of telling you how the non-conserved um, condition is imposed on the Langevin equation, but you can read it from the transparency and we can discuss it later if you want. Okay, so this is uh, the theoretical setting. Now, what happens? So the target configurations I discussed already at the critical point is fluctuations of all sizes, is the typical kind of um, configuration which look like this. At below the critical point is one of the two other states, let's say the white one with fluctuations within. Uh, this is a real space viewpoint and the quench to the critical point would like to approach this or would like to approach that but it takes a long time to do it. So this is what I have already shown. Uh, now, how does it do it? So in both cases, critical or subcritical quenches, one can observe that the sizes of regions in real space, which look like in equilibrium at critical temperature or below the critical temperature, grow in time. So this is an observation. You look at the pictures and you realize that this is what's going on. But the sizes of those equilibrated patches are always finite when the times are finite and don't scale with the system size. So for all finite times, I have you know, equilibrium developing over certain regions, but not reaching the total system size unless I scale time with the system size. Um, so this is just the same statement. So in both cases, one sees the growth of red and white patches, interfaces surrounding such geometrical domains. Um, these special regions of local equilibrium with vanishing or non-vanishing other parameter grow in time. So 
how do they grow in time? One can claim that there will be some growing length, some length that will characterize these patches, that it's growing in time, that will depend on time because it's growing in time, but it would also depend on the temperature at which you are doing the quench. So it may be different at the critical point and below the critical point. So I see that the host has a spot lighted. I don't know what it means. The video for a while. Let me check time. Yeah. So what does yeah, it mean? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, hello. Yes, I can hear you. Uh, yeah, so uh, this. Hello? Yes? Yeah, so this uh, the, the, the relaxation time uh below the critical temperature is it uh, is the, is it different from the scaling is different from the below, above critical point yes of course so above the critical point the relaxation time is finite it can be very long if you get close to the critical point but here is finite so there is some relaxation time here uh which is non infinity here it doesn't depend on the system size and it doesn't diverge with the system size so it's fine while below the critical point, the equilibration time depends on the system size and it you know, grows with the system size till so it's here. It's, uh, it's, it's here. So, so we can say that below, when you're quenching the system below the critical point, it never equilibrates. Exactly. For an infinite system, it will never equilibrate. It will, you will always see larger and larger structures, but they will never reach the system size. So is so it due to the... Like, yeah, I would just want to know why it's happening. Is it due to this recorticity breaking uh, happening there because the system can't access all the state? Because, yeah, because the mechanism, you know, for ordering, uh, it's ordering locally, but it's not efficient enough to uh, order globally. So locally, it's uh, acting because, okay, you have short range interactions and locally the, the energy is trying to be diminished and then, you know, uh, you, you order locally, but to expand this local ordering towards the end of the system, uh, it will take a time scale. It's a bit of a causality. The people in 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 in, in the gravity like to call call it causality. Okay, if you want to call it causality, it takes time to 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 to, um, to transport information from you know some local place to uh, the end of the system. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Leticia, I think there are a few questions uh, in yes, the chat. Yes, the chat. Okay, let me let me look at the chat. Um, yes, I want to go to the chat. Ah, yeah, now I go. Uh, ta -ta -ta, more chat. Uh, what is the meaning of absorbing states? Can you please explain it elaborately? Okay, I prefer not to talk about this because it was just, you know, to mention it for people who, who knew it, um, because otherwise it would take me long and I will not be able to go to the, you know, dynamic scaling and so on. But uh, I can, you know, you can send me an email and then I can send you references uh, in privately. What quantity we need to calculate mathematically to cope up with the term Topological defects. Okay, uh, so yeah, uh, so there are particular formulae that will tell you, you know, whether you have a topological defect in your system or not. So um, uh, typically, what people do is to impose boundary conditions. So, for example, if you want to have an interface in your system that will count as topological defect, what you would do is impose boundary conditions which are oppositely oriented at the borders, say in the X direction of your system, then the system will like to you know, magnetize in one direction on one side and the other direction on the other one. So there should be an interface in the middle for, you know, necessarily. And then, uh, okay, then you can, you know, have a look at how, in, study how this interface uh, behaves and uh, see properties of it. When you have vectorial spins, then you can look at the, um, at the uh, circulation of the spin ar around a given point, and then you will pinpoint the vortex that will be at the middle of uh, this uh, circular um, path that you are taking, and then you can, you know, 
define uh, the charge of the vortex, whether it turns in this way, your vectors, or it turns in the other way, the vectors, and things like this. So there, there are ways to define them. It depends on the kind of topological effect you're dealing with. I don't need to go beyond uh, just you know the qualitative description in my talks for the moment. So I, I stop like this. Uh, in this particular example, is the dynamics conserved or not? So in the easing model, I'm showing the dynamics is not locally conserved because the magnetization is changing. But you can do uh, other cases, uh, phase separating cases with um, uh, the, the easing description of it with the, you know, one kind of spin representing uh, each species and uh, apply this conserved or the parameter just exchange of spins locally dynamics, which is also called Kawasaki dynamics in the context of a spin system, and, uh, and, and, and see how the figures differ. They do differ a little bit. The form of the interfaces is a little bit different, and uh, also the growth will be different. The, the R of T, which I haven't discussed yet, will have a different dependence on time. So. Can you comment? When is the inertia term important for the field evolution? Uh, so it depends on the value of the um, friction coefficient compared to the mass. So uh, if um, the um, gamma is large compared to the mass, then you can drop the inertia term and go to this overdumped limit uh, safely. Uh, if uh, instead the friction coefficient is small, especially if it goes to zero, then you go back to some kind of Newtonian dynamics. And then, uh, then of course, you cannot drop the inertia term because otherwise you're left with uh, no evolution at all. So it's an, an issue of how gamma compares to M. And for the applications that have to do with magnetic systems or phase separating systems in statistical mechanics, it's always quite safe to drop the um, inertia term and work in the overdamped limit. Um, so, uh, sorry about that. It makes the calculations much easier as well. Yes. Like uh, for uh, birds also, I mean, flocking also, you have, uh, you, I mean, there's no inertia term, right? Mm. Like when exactly in, in this, uh, yeah, in these um, um, active branding particles I was talking about, one usually drops the inertia. But then there are now some people are interested in the effects of inertia and they are keeping inertia and looking at, you know, how the uh, flocking and so on may change due to keeping the inertia term. So it's not completely relevant, uh, you know, in certain applications, even in active matter. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm. How do I write the Langevin like time evolution equations for the fields? Uh, well, one proposes it. So just uh, you propose a Langevin equation for the field and you write it and then you go ahead. Yes. Is there a growth in a special regions locally, even when we quench above critical temperature, but close to TC? Okay, this I think I, I answered, right? So if you close, if you quench close to TC, you grow uh, critical regions of finite size, and then depending on how far or uh, close to TC you are, uh, you are you know, larger or smaller. Actually, smaller or larger in the way I, I said it. You said that the infinite time scale is due to a competition between local and global behavior in infinite systems. But doesn't this phenomenon occur also at the mean field level with long range interactions or in finite dimensions? Yeah, OK. It, 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 it also, uh, yeah, uh, so in, it, one should distinguish, uh, concerning this question, one should distinguish, uh, you know, the finite dimensional short range interacting cases from the mean field problems. In the mean field problems, you also have, um, you know, gradual growth of order, uh, but then you cannot claim that you have this causal, um, you know, uh, reason for the dynamics being slow and you have to argue in different ways. I agree with that, yes. But in you know realistic applications, let's say uh, you know in physical systems where you have finite dimensions and short range interactions, then uh, what I said about the causality and the propagation of information is true. Um, okay, this one I answered. Is a failure to reach equilibrium in infinite 
Oh, sorry, it's moving. If a failure detection is due to local order mechanisms, taking infinite time to influence the whole system, does that mean that the systems having long range interactions will equilibrate faster in general? It depends on the kind of interactions uh, that you have, uh, you know, of long range kind. Yes. So if you have interactions which are all um, uh, favoring the same kind of order, it's true that you can go faster and you will change this exponent here. It will depend on you know, the, the range of the interaction. And there are many papers recently, um, also by Indian groups, uh, in collaboration with the Salerno people and uh, with Politi in Firenze, um, studying these issues. Uh, so yes, I agree with that. But then when you have long range interactions, sometimes you also have frustration. So competition of the interactions and then makes things more complicated. So, you know, uh, so it's, um, but yeah, if uh, I agree with you that if you have long range interactions, they can be favorable to, to go faster towards equilibrium. How is the growth influenced by the presence of an external magnetic field for the easing model? So if, exactly. So if you apply an external magnetic field on the easing model, basically what you are doing in this kind of picture is your, uh, lifting and uh, you're killing the um, the um, uh, degeneracy between the two minima so there will be one which will be much lower than the other one because of the field so you tilt no, this uh, form and uh, what you do is you push then your system with the external field towards the equilibrium which corresponds to the minimum of the two of the two wells so in that case uh, the system will go much faster to equilibrium and you will not have this kind of competition between the two um, you know, uh, configurations which were equally probably be beforehand and they are not any longer if you are like that. So um, these kind of phenomena that I'm talking about are uh, not as present uh, with the field and uh, you know, things are much more boring in this sense. Uh, so, what if we, instead of starting in a disordered state, start in the wrong minima? Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, so I was asking, what if we start in the wrong minima, instead of starting with a disordered state initially? Say in the minima on the left side. If you start the system initially on the minima on the left side, on the figure. Yes. Ah, OK. Then... Yeah, yeah. So then you have a, a different kind of phenomenon, which is the phenomenon of nucleation. You know, you see, so what you have to do if you start on this side, um, I mean, this is a naive description of what the system will do, but it's helping uh, understand. So you start from an initial configuration, which is magnetized in the negative direction, let's say. Yes, and then you want to magnetize it in the positive direction because this state is more favorable because it's lower. So what the system will have to do is to nucleate a bubble of this other kind of positive magnetization and jump over this barrier. So this is a kind of another problematics, which is the problematics of nucleation. And we will not talk about that. Uh, and it's linked to the fact that the transition in a field uh, in uh, easing problems is of first order. Uh, but okay, that, this is another kind of uh, phenomenon. But basically what the system has to do, it has to reverse its magnetization and it will do it through the nucleation of a bubble of the opposite um, order. And then this bubble, when it's big enough, it will very quickly conquer the system. And the nucleation is difficult if I have uh, large system sizes? No, the nucleation is a kind of a local phenomenon. So it's a, of a different kind. So you, the size, what will happen is that the system will grow nuclei of a small size, they will disappear. Of a larger size, uh, they will also disappear. But there is a critical size be, be, be beyond which, uh, when you buy a thermal fluctuation, creates such a bubble, it will conquer the system very quickly. So uh, it's it is not this critical size is not depending on the system size. It's um, it's, an, it's basically the competition between how much free energy you win. The system wins because of going to the bubble with this other magnetization, and which is the cost of the interface that it has to build necessarily between the background of the magnetization on the left and the in 
side of the bubble of the magnetization in the right. So it's a competition between these two contributions to the free energy that um, that will decide which is the critical size of the bubble that you need. But it's finite in terms of uh, it doesn't depend on the system size. Okay, thank you. You're right. Um, okay, so there is also a question, you know, can, can one compute gamma, the friction coefficient in Langevin equation from, for fields from microscopics? So, oh, this is very difficult. No, I mean, it's, uh, it's complicated. So um, it depends on the coupling to the bath. It depends on the characteristics on the bath. Uh, so for simple models of baths, uh, like uh, harmonic oscillators and so on, then you can do it. But otherwise, uh, you always have some assumption in, between, in the middle. I mean, otherwise it's not possible. Yeah. Okay, so now I can go ahead. I think, okay, it's eight o'clock, so I'm not going very fast, but it doesn't matter. So uh, now about dynamic scaling. So if one looks at the configurations, at, in this case, a given time, and builds correlation functions between spins sitting at different sites in the system at a given distance, which I'm calling R, and uh, then you to take an average, and the average you can take over all pairs of spins at distances r, the chosen r, you build in this way the correlation function, the space-time correlation function is usually called this way. So c of r and t, depends on distance and depends on the time at which you do this measurement. And what you will see is that these correlation functions decay with distance. So the pins are more correlated when they are nearby and they're not correlated when they are far away. But the way in which these correlations decay with distance also depends on time. So at short times, the correlation decays fast to zero in space. At longer times, it decays slower and so on and so forth. And since when you do these simulations, you, always, you also have very smart algorithms that allow you to equilibrate the sample at the critical point, you can compare to the correlation function at the critical point in equilibrium, which is given by this black dotted curve here. And what you see is that, you know, for all the times which have been used to measure the space-time correlation function, the forms of the curves are very different from the target equilibrium one, which is in black dotted uh, lines here. So for all these times, you are very far away from equilibrium. And if you look a little bit more carefully, you see that for short distances, you get close to the equilibrium curve. I mean, the, the curves are really nearby here, but for long distances, they're not. You can also see that for the longer the time, the also longer the distance over which the dynamic out of equilibrium curve resembles or is equal to, uh, within numerical accuracy, the equilibrium one. But uh, still, I mean, this is only expanding very short distances. You see it's uh, up to this distance here. As soon as you go beyond this distance, uh, the curves are very different from the dotted black line. So, okay, this shows you, proves that the system is out of equilibrium over all these times. Uh, the target equilibrium correlation function at the critical point, you know that it's a power law. So this dotted line is this power law here with some exponent that is also known analytically, uh, but all the dynamical curves are different from that. So what you can do is to say, well, I want to extract a typical length from these correlation functions. I want to extract this growing length I was talking about beforehand. How can I do it? There are different ways to do it, but the simplest one is to say, I'm going to define it as the value of the distance at which the dynamic correlation function equals one over E. One over E is a number. It's just some you know, decay from the value one, which is by normalization, the value of the correlation at uh, distance zero. Uh, but okay, let me say that when it goes to one over E, which is roughly at this level, uh, I can just draw a line, a straight line here, and from the crossing of the dynamical curves with this horizontal line, I extract this typical length, okay? So if I do that, 
I observe that this critical length grows with time, but you see if I draw an horizontal line here, uh, the longer the time, the longer the length uh, at which I cross the dynamical curves. And if I extract the way in which this growing length scales with time, I will observe that it goes like a power law with an exponent z, z, uh, which is uh, typical of the critical point. And that, um, okay, it's a critical exponent, I call it this way. And in the two-dimensional leasing model, it turns out to be 2.17. This is from numerical simulations and also from analytical calculations. Uh, you get a value which is slightly above two. Okay, so this is a way to define and extract this growing length. Uh, then I can say, well, what happens below the critical point? So I can do a similar construction. I can look at this space-time correlation function below the critical point, and I will see that there is also a behavior of this kind for the dynamical curves, and I can extract a growing length, and I will see that the growing length also goes as a power law, only that the exponent will be different. It will be two, exactly two, at below the critical point. At the critical point, it's a little bit above two. Um, good. So I know now I have a, you know, uh, say, way to, um, operational way to, to, to measure this growing length. Now, dynamic scaling is a little bit more than just measuring this growing length. It's also the statement that there is only one length, this one, the one I have defined, that I could have measured in different ways, but for all ways uh, in which I can measure, it's always the same depending dependence on time that I get. And that with this length, I can scale all the correlation functions I could imagine uh, that I would like to measure. So for example, I have this space-time correlation function, which I have already defined. Dynamic scaling tells me that I can rewrite this correlation function as a function of the ratio between the length at which I'm measuring and this growing length. So this is the statement in this first line here. And so you see it's a function of the measuring length over or above this uh, growing length. I can also compute two time correlation functions. So at the same point in space, I can compare the value of the spin at a given time tw and at a later time t, as I was defining yesterday. So this is a local in space, non-local in time correlation function. And dynamic scaling tells me that this quantity should depend on times only through the growing length. So this quantity should be a function, another one, not the same one as above, another function, but a function of the ratio between the lengths measured at time t and at time tw. So if you compute higher order correlation functions involving more spins, what measured at different times, dynamic scaling will tell you that you have to make all the ratios between the growing lengths at the times of measurement. And if you have different lengths, uh, well, you have to make ratios between lengths of measurement and the growing length at the times at which you are measuring. This dynamic scaling is expected to hold for distances which are um, smaller than the system size and which are larger than the um, um, and then the um, some microscopic length or the uh, correlation length uh, at the temperature at which you are measuring. I'm talking about lower temperatures here. So this is uh, at lower temperatures. If you are at the critical point, there is a little modification of the uh, scalings I'm showing that I will discuss later on. Uh, so this is uh, below the, the critical temperature. Um, so this dynamic scaling was suggested by experiments actually and numerical simulations from the 70s. Uh, it has not been proved in many cases, but it's a hypothesis uh, that is working very well for these coarsening systems and has been verified numerically in many, many different cases. And if you want to know more about this, of course, there is this very, uh, very well known uh, review article by Alan Bray from the 90s, uh, where he's also you know, describing this dynamic scaling in many details. And Leticia, uh 
shouldn't there uh, isn't there a prefactor before the scaling function because in the standard critical phenomena something comes from the dimension of exactly so in at the crit it is the quench to the critical point there is a prefactor here uh, which is basically this form that you have uh, you know for the critical uh, okay at the critical uh, in equilibrium at the critical point but if you do it below the critical point, this is why I said this slide was for below the critical point, uh, then the prefactor is not there. So there are no Onstein's any kind of form even below critical point? Sorry, there is no? There's no Onstein's any kind of form for the correlation below critical point? Uh, okay, uh, uh, yeah, I will go back to that. Uh, okay, so this is related your question to, or I mean, I should have been more precise. Um, to the lens at which I'm focusing when I write these forms. Um, let me go back to this issue in a second. I will explain it better. Yeah. Thank you. So what does this dynamic scaling means is that, okay, in this phase order in kinetics, uh, well, now in this slide, I'm calling the rowing length L because the, in the picture I had an L, but it's the same R as before. Um, the, so if you look at the... Um, configurations with, um, with the magnifying glasses, uh, you know, uh, what you will see is statistically the same thing as what you saw uh, without the magnifying glass, okay? And the, the way in which uh, you are scaling this lens is um, through this uh, R of T. Um, okay, so um, let me see what I had here. Uh, Yeah, I should, I mean, actually should, I, may, I mix a little bit my slides. So this is why this is maybe a little bit confusing. So this is the example um, that I have should have shown after the uh, uh, critical quench. So this is a, an example where I'm quenching this easing model to zero temperature. I do the same measurement of uh, space time correlation functions. I see the similar time dependence with the, uh, you know, longer times decaying slower in distance than, than shorter times. And as I said, if I cut these curves, I would extract a growing length with the Z exponent that is equal to two instead of 2.17. So this is uh, just to show that. Dynamic scaling uh, at work below the critical point. Uh, here it is. So if I look at the correlation functions at different distances, different times, and I plot them as a function of distance of measurement over the growing length, I should get a master curve. This is what dynamic scaling tells me. And uh, if I do it uh, from the numerics, for example, then I see that the different colors which correspond to different times of measurement uh, scale very well one on top of each other. So by doing this kind of plots, I and I'm, I'm able to extract this function fc here. Uh, okay, and I also, by doing this kind of plots, I'm able to extract the growing length because I can work in a different way. I can claim I don't know the growing length, but then I look for the functional form that makes all these data points collapse on top of each other. And then in this way, I can also extract the growing length uh, independently of this crossing formulation that I proposed before. So concerning the, the prefactors that you were asking me about and that I didn't discuss very precisely beforehand. Uh, so this dynamic scaling I was telling you about, I said, it was supposed to be applying for lengths of measurement, which are much smaller than the system size, because otherwise I'm getting finite size effects, but also much larger than something. And I didn't explain it very carefully what this something was. So, Isha, um, yes. In the previous slide, uh, the plot that you have showed is for non conserved order parameter dynamics. Yes. Uh, if you have conserved order parameter dynamics, uh, will you have the same scaling? You will have the same scaling with a different R because the Z exponent is different. So instead of being two, it will be three. <laughs> and so um, the, the form of R will be different and the form of the master curve will be different as well. So the master curve uh, also depends on, on, the, um, on, the, the, on, the, yeah, on the universality classes you are working with. So, um, so now about the, the prefactor. So if I look at the critical quench, uh, 
there should be a prefactor, as you very well uh, pointed out, uh, that has to take into account the behavior in equilibrium. Because as I said, when I discussed these plots here for the critical quench, I said that for lengths which are very short, I see that the dynamical curves fall on top of the equilibrium one. While for long distances, they don't. They go uh, well, they're well below the equilibrium ones. So the system has not built the correlations of equilibrium at long distances, but it has done it for these times at short distances. So this means that This means that if I look at distances which are much shorter than this growing length, this argument in the function f, say it goes to zero, if r is much more shorter than rc. So f of zero is unconstant, but the correlation decays with distance as in equilibrium. So there should be a prefactor hmm, that takes into account this equilibrium correlation function that is uh, also observed out of equilibrium, but only at short distances. So this is why the full form of the correlation function as a function of time and space should include a prefactor with the form of the equilibrium correlation function at the critical point. I'm talking about equilibrium, uh, sorry, I'm quenches to the critical point in this case. So you see this prefactor for long distances loses importance because then for long distances, the argument of this function f will not be zero, will be growing from zero towards one and beyond one. And uh, then the um, decay of the function f as a function of its argument will modify uh, the prefactor. I mean, the prefactor is there, but the full form of the correlation will be dominated by how this function f decays with argument at large values of the arguments. And uh, this function f then will characterize the decay at long distances. And you see that since the correlations decay to zero at long distances, this function f should also uh, decay to zero at long distances. So this is uh, to complete the uh, full form of the correlation function four quenches at the critical point. And uh, I'm insisting here in black uh, on the fact that this CX of R should take the form of the critical correlation uh, in equilibrium at the critical point. So it should be a power law. And then I also know that the argument going to zero, this function F I, has to go to a constant. I can normalize it and make it one. And uh, then at short distances, I have exactly the decay of equilibrium at the critical point, while at long distances uh, is the second factor that dominates and uh, you know gives me this uh, scaling uh, of um, the um, full correlation function as a function of r over the growing length. So I think that this uh, completes the, the answer to your question uh, about the, the, the missing prefactor in the form that I showed before. Yeah, I was still a bit confused. So there are two length scale. One is the equilibrium correlation length, uh, if you're doing just like, and another is this growing length scale, right? Right. Uh, so exactly. you're doing scaling theory based on these two relevant scales. Yes, but here yeah. see, I'm, I'm assuming I'm exactly at the critical ah, point okay. and I'm long at uh, infinite size for the system. So the equilibrium correlation lengths diverge. I, that is infinite. So do you have only one relevant scale? Well, then I'm left with only the growing length as a length to consider. I see. Okay. Okay. But, if but you're, I, you're, I, absolutely, yeah. you're absolutely right. If I'm in a situation slightly, you know, away from the critical point or for finite size systems, then I have to take into account also the equilibrium correlation length and also maybe the, the system size, right? So I have to compare, you know, yeah. I, there should be another scaling variable, which would be the equilibrium correlation length over the system size, for example, and then, uh, yeah. Okay, thank I'll you. Take care of that one, I agree. Thanks. Now, what happens with the subcritical quenches? So in the subcritical quenches, um, if I look 
within, let me see if I have a picture here, yes. So here I have done the quench to zero temperature. So at zero temperature, the equilibrium magnetization is identically one or minus one. So there are no fluctuations within the local ordered domains of uh, you know, white and black color in this slide. But if I were doing a, a, a quench to a temperature which is slightly or above zero and below the critical point, the magnetization within domains is not going to be saturated to one or minus one, it will be a little bit different from it. So what I have to capture also is these fluctuations within domains uh, that uh, are typical of finite temperature evolution. So what will play the role in the um, lower temperature quenches of this prefactor will be actually an additive term, which will take care of the fact that in equilibrium, the correlation functions don't decay to zero in equilibrium, sorry, as a function of um, either R or T. The correlation functions decay to a finite value, which is M squared, which is different from one, it's smaller than one. So what I'm taking into account with this term here is this equilibrium relaxation within the domains, which are of finite size, but there is a non-trivial relaxation of the correlation function within the domains. And this is uh, captured by this addi additive extra term, which is here. And then the part of the dynamic scaling, which is uh, essential of the out of equilibrium evolution, uh, is of the form of f of uh, well, the same scaling variable. Um, <coughs> and it's represented by this second term here. And the matching between the two contributions is done by imposing these limits, uh, which I'm, I'm writing here. So at r equals zero, cx is equal to one because of normalization. And then you, know, you take also this f of uh, the argument going to one when r goes to zero, and then you, well, everything uh, arranges to have a correlation function equal to one at, this, at distance zero, and then uh, decays at infinite distances. Uh, you arrange with the limits of f uh, as well. Uh, so, how are you taking the uh, equilibrium limit in this assumptions? If it's t tends to infinity? Uh, well, you can take it in different ways, but you can take it also by saying that uh, at short distances, like in the critical quench, also at lower critical quenches, you arrive at situations in which at short distances, the system is like an equilibrium. It is not a long distances. So you can take it by saying that either R goes to zero, or as you said, T goes to infinity. But in both cases, you, you set to zero this uh, argument of the function F. You see, either by taking R to zero, or by taking T to infinity, uh, the argument goes to zero. So these are the two ways to do it. Okay, so if you do that and you impose that F of zero is equal to one, then the MX cancel, and then you have the equilibrium correlation function. Okay, so you get it in a different way from the one that was obtained here, uh, where I was taking F to one, and then you know it was a multiplicative um, uh, scaling that I, or multiplicative form that I have to use at criticality, while below criticality I have to use an additive one because of the fact that below criticality the magnetization is non-zero. Uh, while at criticality it's zero. So this makes the difference between these two forms of um, combining the equilibrium behavior at short distances and the out of equilibrium behavior at long distances. Uh, yeah, uh, hi. Yes, hi. Uh, if I, uh, so if I compute uh, some sort of dynamic uh, response functions and correlation functions, mm -hmm. is it correct to say that uh, 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 for short uh, observables which are like uh, close together, uh, they obey fluctuation dissipation theorem, but uh, observables which are far away, they don't obey. Is it yeah, like yeah, you will have exactly. You will have things like this going on. Yeah. So locally, the system is behaving as if it, it were in equilibrium, uh, but then you know, as soon as you go far away to see the interfaces, then 
you realize and the system realizes that it's far away from equilibrium and that you know factorization dissipation is violated as well yeah so uh, from that uh, violation can we extract some length scale will it agree again with this uh, uh, growing length scale uh, yes yes you can yes you can but you you don't have to forget the influence of time as well because even if you look locally in space uh, at you and you look at short times then okay you Imagine that you are in equilibrium, but imagine that then you start looking at longer times, even locally. Uh, locally, uh, an interface will go through your point, no? Because okay, this is moving all the time, so you know growth is growing. I mean, order is growing, and yeah. then interfaces are moving, and then uh, then you will not be in equilibrium any longer, not even locally. So uh, the the the, lo the local equilibrium hypothesis uh, it's it's an issue about lengths and times put together. Thanks, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so um, I don't have a lot of time, but let me just go through these dynamic universality classes uh, and and tell you a little bit about them. Uh, so from the way in which R C at the critical point of R below the critical point depend on time, you can classify systems uh, into classes. And the classes depend, as I have already said orally, on the dimension of the order parameter, the dynamic mechanism of growth, the microscopic rules, and, um, and basically these are the two, um, the symmetries, which are also related to uh, the dimension of the order parameter and the, the mechanisms of growth. But the, these are the three properties that will, um, distinguish different universality classes. And uh, the, the exact calculation of this growing length, um, well, it's very difficult. At the critical point, you can use RG techniques to extract uh, the growing length and they work uh, fine. You can see uh, how to develop them, for example, from Ubi Tauber's uh, book, where there are lots of details over there. And uh, well, you, you can extract these uh, dynamic exponents easy and see, uh, you know, how to how it varies from, from class to class. Uh, you can also estimate the scaling functions with RG methods, these Fs that I was mentioning, at the critical point. As soon as you go below the critical point, these RGs don't work any longer. Uh, there is no small parameter, really. The problem is non-perturbative, and then, you know, you have to do something else. So there is no systematic method to, to, to obtain this R function below the critical point. Um, okay, so, okay, I had an animation here, but it's not necessary to show it. Um, so for this easing universality class, a scalar order parameter with non-conserved order par parameter dynamics, it turns out that there are many arguments, starting from Allen and Kahn's in the late 70s, that show, argue, actually, I should say, that the exponent is a half. So z is two and uh, t uh, is uh, to the power one half for the growth of r. And this is well established and well behaved, uh, well verified numerically and even experimentally. And so things are quite clear. Uh, for the non-concert or the parameter. And the way in which the Allen-Kahn argument goes uh, very quickly uh, is basically that it realizes that the dynamics in these problems is trying to minimize the curvature of the, um, well, it's, it's, it's driven by the curvature, I should say. So it's uh, just, there is like a force acting on the interfaces in the direction of um, the, the the curvature, or the local curvature of the um, of the interface. So, especially in two dimensions, this can be done very precisely. In three dimensions, is uh, not so clear. But in two dimensions, uh, this is a sketch. So, at each point on the interface, which I'm sketching here with the green line, uh, there is a force pointing into the direction of uh, its local curvature. And for example, here is pointing inwards, here is pointing outwards, here is pointing inwards, inwards, and so on. And basically what the interfaces are trying to do in this way is to become round. They become round, and once they become round, the force acts in the same way on each point of the interface, and it's uh, killing in this way, reducing the size of the 
um, domain which is surrounded by the interface and you know smaller domains are disappearing first and then you know there is a issue like an onion uh, surface sort of thing and so the inner domains are disappearing then the outer domains are disappearing then, and in this way typically the domains are becoming larger this is the mechanism in 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 2d at least in 3d as well but it's a little bit more complex and um, Allen and Kahn wrote an equation manipulating a little bit the um, Langevin dynamics of this problem at zero temperature because it's easier and uh, and then they argued uh, in this way I will not go through the details but they argued that the growth has to go like tip the one half at finite temperature the argument is not uh, possible to be done in this way there is also roughening of the interface due to thermal fluctuations uh, it's much more complex but the exponent a half doesn't depend on temperature so this is also a uh, a, a, an important feature because everything would be much more complex if the exponents depended on the control parameters. But the exponents don't depend on the control parameters in these growth problems. It's only the prefactors which depend on the control parameters. So you can insist upon the universality features because the exponents are universal. They only depend on the universality class in which you are working, uh, but the, the, all the parameter dependence is in the prefactor. Uh, there are experiments, as I said, which um, uh, verify this scaling with the t to the one half. Uh, there are very nice um, experiments done in Tokyo by um, you know, Takeuchi's uh, group. Uh, we'll jump over this. Uh, there's okay, more details. Now, what happens with the, the mixing transitions phase separation kind of problems? Uh, then, as I told you, the forms of the domains are slightly different. And if you go and try to do some theoretical arguments to extract the exponent, it's much more difficult than the allen kahn formulation. And there was a lot of discussion in the literature until relatively recently. And it's only in the 90s that David Hughes came out with, a, with an argument, which is now accepted, that um, establishes that the exponent is uh, one third, so z is equal to three below the critical point for this non -co this concept, sorry, locally conserved or the parameter dynamics. Somebody asked me about the globally conserved or the parameter dynamics, and actually for the globally conserved or the parameter dynamics, the exponent is a half. So it belongs to the other universality class in this sense. So uh, it's for the local one that the exponent is, is, is one third. Um, okay. Uh, then you can look at different problems. You can also make your interactions a little bit random. I will talk about randomness tomorrow, uh, but uh, there, without defining what I mean by this, uh, you can work with random ferromagnets and there the growth is much slower and the growth is like a logarithm function of time in this case. And again, okay, there are arguments by Villan, uh, Hughes and Henley, and uh, we did a lot of numerical simulations with my friends in Argentina, who are the experts in, in, in interface dynamics. And uh, okay, it's now quite clear that the um, growth is like a logarithm, but of course, you know, distinguishing a logarithm from a small power is very difficult. So there has been a lot of discussion in the past uh, because people were claiming that it, perhaps it was a, a power law growth for these disorder magnets uh, with an exponent which was depending on temperature. Instead, now I think it's clear that it's a logarithm and then, you know, it's uh, the exponent, which is here, is not depending on temperature, but the growth is extremely slow. You can look at what happens with the um, uh, vectorial problems. So this is X, Y model in two dimensions. And then you have these vortices, which are playing a role, costally powerless uh, kind of physics. And uh, there the growth is like a power law of time corrected with a logarithm. Again, again, you know, being able to see this logarithm is not so easy, but now it's um, also established that the logarithm is there. And then you have this form of growth. You can what, kind, what kind of correlation do you look for this O2 model? Is this transverse correlation, so longitudinal, or...? In the, in the um, you know, it's just, uh, you know, uh, spin, spin. I think I wrote it above, and it's not there. I cannot see because I have the, let me see. 
Uh, no, I didn't write it. So it's a spin-spin correlation function uh, with the scalar product between them. So okay. you can do this correlation function uh, in space-time, and you can also do time-time correlation functions. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. I can jump over this. So I mentioned quantum problems. There is a lot of activity in the, um, what they call dissipative and driven Gross-Pitayevsky equations, and these are groups in England uh, who look at uh, the, the the growth of order in these problems, which are related to the to the XY model, and they also have the logarithm corrections there. Uh, these are very precise and very extensive numerical simulations that they do. So, okay, this is the list of uh, universality classes of the main um, types that are studied in the literature. Uh, so, scalar non conserved is T to the one half, a scalar conserved is one third, planar, which is to the XY model, is the T with the log correction to the one half, weak disorder non conserved is log to some power. Of course, there are other cases as well. I'm not expanding all of them here. Um, there are issues concerning what happens with the scaling functions. So um, there are people who have claimed in the past that the scaling functions shouldn't depend so much on um, details of the, um, of the microscopic dynamics and so on and so forth, but there are still some, some open issues there. So the scaling functions are more difficult to, to, to say you know, concrete things about them. Uh, so, okay, I will not say more about this, but I, just to mention that there's a current activity around trying to characterize well the, the scaling functions. Uh, so this is just a summary of what I said. Uh, okay, so I was going planning to talk about aging, which is a, a property of uh, materials that people in material science have studied in much uh, in a lot of detail, and that also plays an important role in in glassy physics. It's Time to stop now, so I will resume tomorrow with uh, the discussion of um, two-time correlation functions and what is called aging, also about response functions I will talk about tomorrow, and there's a little bit about mean field models, and then I will talk about uh, the effects of disorder. So I'm a little bit late with the program, but it doesn't matter. I knew it was too much material to, to cover in, in one lecture, and then uh, you know I will arrange for, for the future lectures uh, to be able to tell you about everything without, uh, you know, uh, going beyond my time. So uh, I will stop here. Uh, maybe if you have questions, I can answer your questions right now. Uh, just you know, let me know. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's some questions in the chat. Okay, okay. Let me see. Uh, how is the growth influence at the presence of external magnetic field? I have answered. Can one compute gamma? No, I said no. Um, is this growing length sometimes referred as correlation length? Yes, it is. But I prefer not to call it correlation length because correlation length is more, to me, uh, the name that is given to the equilibrium one. Uh, so I prefer to call it growing length. And moreover, the word growing, the adjective growing is, you know, really telling you what this length is doing. It, it is growing. So um, yeah, uh, coherence length is also sometimes uh, called. But, you know, it growing, it, really gives the idea of what it is. But does the system prefer to, to obey dynamic scaling at all? Well, <laughs> good question. Um, yeah, I don't know how to answer that. I mean, uh, it's like a, I would say it's a, it's a very deep property of all these systems. So, uh, but why this is so, I don't know. Why is the domain growth process set similar? Well, again, this is similar to the previous question, right? It turns out to be. Uh, so there is this dynamic scaling property that uh, is just extending the properties of uh, scaling in equilibrium. And uh, in a sense, well, this growing length is playing the role of the coherence length, but with the addendum that, okay, there is a time dependence in it. So it's like if there is an, another length which is developing in the system and it's you know characterizing how equilibrium properties are uh, expanding uh, within the system but I, I don't know if i can say something deeper than that can you mention some references where they try to include finite temperature effects to allen kahn equations um hmm. uh, i'm not sure there are uh, with the argument of the curvature um, we had some arguments with Alan Bray in a paper which I can I can 
cite uh, in the in the talks tomorrow um, because but it's well basically what we were trying to do is to um, give some arguments um, about how the prefactor should depend on temperature. So maybe this is the best that one can do. Because you see the temperature dependence is only in this prefactor, which I called lambda in the, in the notes. And um, it's very difficult to say something about, you know, how it depends on, on temp here. Okay, all these, all these lambdas which appear here. And um, so temperature is there. And then we gave some arguments about how it should behave for easing universality class. And um, this is the best I think that I can tell you about because there is very little about this. Uh, so yeah, I, I, will sh I will include in the notes uh, or send me an email and I'll send you the reference. Um, but I, I don't think there is much more than that. Um, is this slide on critical versus subcritical, uh, you mentioned something about equilibrium relaxation within the domains below critical temperature. Can you please explain it a little about it? Okay. So let me see, maybe with a picture it will be easier. One which shouldn't be at zero temperature. And one of the first ones should be, okay, not this one. Okay. So, Okay, so even this one is also at very low temperature. I'm sorry, I took the bad examples. Uh, so if you have, let me do it on the blackboard and somewhere else. Good, yeah. So imagine that you have a system in equilibrium with magnetization larger than zero. So mostly everywhere, the system is up. But there will be, because of thermal fluctuations, because T is not zero, but a little bit about zero, some spins which are flipped in the opposite direction to the background one. So at a given time, you will see that, say, these four spins are flipped in the opposite direction of the uh, one of the background. So this is T1. But now, sorry, I don't have another color. So at T2, later on, this one will have turned and realized that you know, they wanted to be up because the background was telling them to be up. But some other ones will turn round and will be down. And then at a larger, longer time, T3, these ones will go up again because the surroundings tell them to go up and some other ones will go down. So you see that M is larger than zero and smaller than one, not equal to one because of these thermal fluctuations within the equilibrium configuration that exists at temperature different from zero. So in equilibrium, if you look at the correlation function between two different positions or the local one between two different times, the correlation functions is not equal to one. It decays with distance or it decays with time. And basically it decays, it decorrelates. Uh, in a way that it goes to mx squared. This can be argued because the correlation which is SS basically, with the S measured at different sites or at different times. If you look at them at very different distances, very long distances or very long, very delayed times, it will factor out and will factor in two terms. And each of these terms will be M, 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 M here as well, M, M. and uh, well, it will go to M squared. Okay. so. Even in equilibrium, there is a decorrelation because of the thermal fluctuations. At zero temperature, there is no decorrelation because mx is one. So, you know, c is equal to one. Everything is perfectly ordered and there are no fluctuations. But um, because of thermal fluctuations, there is decorrelation. Now, out of equilibrium, you don't have a full system completely ordered with these 
thermal fluctuations within, but you have patches of regions of white and red, which are ordered. But within these regions, not in this picture because it was done at very low temperature, but if you were doing this simulation at a temperature which is not strictly zero, then you will see reversed spins within the red region or within the, black, the white region. And those are the decorrelations like in equilibrium, but they are still uh, there out of equilibrium that occur uh, you know, at long, but not that long distances. So that's the, the argument. Uh, okay, this one and that. When we change a system in both cases, non-conserved and conserved, the other parameter remains zero during the coarsening, indeed, the global one. Eh? The global other parameter remains zero during coarsening. But the special correlation behaves differently. Why? Well, it's like, basically it's in this picture here that you have to think about it. So when I go here, the global other parameter is zero because you have as many white and red regions in your sample. And if you sum over all of them, you average them to zero. Uh, but if you look carefully in the structure of the configurations, well, you will see that there are correlations which are developing. So you see it here. Hmm? So there are correlations in space and there would also be correlations in time that develop. So, you know, if you look globally, you don't see these correlations, but if you look locally or, you know, at mesoscopic, say, distances, then you see them. So it's a, it's a in a sense, it's a problem of the global order parameter that misses uh, the development of these structures because it's not looking carefully enough, I would say. Uh, something else that could be said in this, direction is that in this picture, in the picture of the uh, Ginsburg Lambda of free energy, the fact that the global order parameter is zero during coarsening means that you are always on the top of the mountain uh, in the um, central maximum uh, of the um, free energy landscape. So um, you see, there's a lot of things which are going on, but from the Ginsburg Lambda point of view, you are on a point. And all these things which are going on in that picture, you don't see them because that picture is so too, too coarse, too, you know, too, it's not sufficiently detailed to let you know these uh, features which are occurring during the evolution of the sample. Uh, that I understand. Okay. Are there any qualitative differences in the interface dynamics of systems with continuous? Um, Continuous up, I don't know what's up, and systems with discrete, ah, continuous or discrete operators. Yes, of course, yes. Continuous Sorry if you address this. Other parameters. Maybe. Other parameters, oh, okay, thank you. Yes, 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 there, there, there are many differences. Uh, so um, the uh, easing case uh, with the scalar, all the parameters, um, they are relatively um, easy to understand what the interfaces are doing with this curvature driven dynamics and so on. Uh, while if you have uh, what people call internal degrees of freedom to the interfaces, it's much more complicated. So um, the, the, the relevant people to who at least are interested, I don't, I don't remember if they have you know, real results, but okay, um, you know, Thierry Jean Marquis has worked a lot on interfaces and, and his group, uh, the people in, in in, in France, people in Argentina, and experimentalists, and so on, and they in magnetic systems, and they uh, try to understand, you know, what's the role played by vectorial interfaces and so on and so forth. But it's a complicated problem. So yeah. Okay. So I think that now I have answered the questions. Um, so don't hesitate to send e emails uh, to me, uh, especially the ones who ask for references, I can send them by email. And uh, if you have other questions, I can also answer by email. And otherwise we can, you know, tomorrow before the talk as we did today, uh, can come here, you know, like 10 or 15 minutes beforehand and we can discuss also. Can I ask a new question now? Right yes, now? yes. Yeah, uh, so like uh, for at critical temperature, let's say for boiling water, uh, we see bubbles coming. So uh, like those bubbles can be thought of these domains which are for me. I mean, I, I just want to understand, uh, can we think of it something like that uh, in a sense? 
Yes, yes, yes. You can think that they are domains, but then you have to be careful whether the phase transition you are thinking about is, uh, you know, it's a second order or first order. Uh, so if it's a second order, then what I'm I'm just discussing second order phase transitions or infinite order, if you wish, for the costal establish case. But uh, I'm not discussing first order ones. So um, it's just uh, this is the um, the the. The proviso that uh, I just have to mention, but uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, as soon as you have you know two phases coexisting, and then you 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 can try to think about those uh, phenomena in in the terms of what I've been discussing. Okay, uh, Leticia, I had one last question. So related to what was asked at the very beginning, related to whether it's a quench or you start from already some very atypical configure mixed configuration at certain. So the quench is just because you want to create in real life to go to that particular disorder configuration. Is that? Mm -hmm. And but in in the modeling, it uh, you don't necessarily need to start. It's just you're starting with some atypical, very disordered configuration and letting it evolve from there and how it system approaches the. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. In the modeling, you if you for example. At the critical points, there are very smart algorithms that allow you to equilibrate. They are not physical in the sense that, you know, you turn around uh, droplets uh, constructed in some way, clusters of spins. So they are not physical in this sense, but they are very efficient to equilibrate at the critical point. So you could say, for example, I equilibrate at the critical point. Uh, with one of these very smart algorithms, and then I quench from the critical point to below the critical point. What happens? How the you know critical configuration that I have initially uh, evolves towards equilibrium at the lower critical uh, conditions? So with the modeling, you can do different kinds of things. You can even say the opposite. You could do the opposite quench. So you can start from zero temperature ground state. Everybody saw that, and then you hit to the critical points and you ask, are the critical correlations developing in the same way for this ordered initial condition as they are for the totally disordered infinite temperature initial condition that I was discussing in my lectures? And, and, and then there are issues which are the same and issues which are not. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, the initial condition also have, a, have, have effects um, on the behavior of the, um, of the coarsening phenomenon or the kinetic growth phenomena. Uh, so, um, yeah, you can do different, um, you know, different ways of uh, initializing your system and seeing what, what, how it evolves, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, so I guess we should uh, probably uh, stop here. Uh, so uh, thanks a lot, uh, Leticia, and uh, uh, see you tomorrow. Thank, thank you very much. I, I oh, insist upon the fact that I enjoy answering questions, so I'm very happy for all the questions that I'm getting. Thank you very much, and see you tomorrow morning. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.